Welcome everybody, this is Tim Watrous, President of Digital Advisors. And this is Kevin Gordon, President of Capital Advisors Group. We'd like to welcome you to our K-12 Politics and Tech video series. Our objective is to give you the absolute latest of what's going on in Sacramento that affects public school districts, obviously, and as well as all the technology stuff that's going on that's so vital to delivering for kids these days. And remember, if you find these videos useful, please take a moment to subscribe to the channel and share out over social media. You're our marketing team. We appreciate your support. And let's go ahead and get started. All right, welcome everybody. Tim Watrous, President of Digital Advisors, back with another episode of K-12 Politics and Tech. As always, Kevin Gordon, co-host of the show, President of Capital Advisors is here as well. Kevin, glad to have you back. We, we finally got some real news to deliver. Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Almost there. And uh, again, uh, our frequent and favorite guest, uh, Governor Bob Wise. I don't need to do the long intro because I feel like the people who watch this show uh, know who you are by now, Bob. But Bob, welcome. Glad to have you back. And I finally write, they did pass a stimulus bill. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Hey, yeah. So you don't need your fork and knife today. <laughs> uh, so so uh, let's start with uh, basically the fact that the, the stimulus is finally, you know, actually, let's start with the fact that we're going to do a stimulus breakdown show. Kevin, we, we just planned this uh, because we want to do a deep dive. But can you talk a little bit about this, this show? We're going to do it uh, January 5th at 11 a.m. So mark your calendars. That's Tuesday, January 5th at 11 a.m. And can you talk a little bit about some of the uh, investigation we'll do into the stimulus, Kevin? Yeah, I mean, the, the reality is, is that it deserves more time to go into the details. And one of the things that has always happened with this federal money, we saw it in the spring, is just sort of a lot of questions about what the mechanics are of it. And so we're going to get into that and we're going to focus both on kind of the policy fiscal rules, if you will, you know, what's allowed, as well as a good uh, really unpacking of the impacts on technology issues. And we know, again, the overwhelming majority of spending that went on in this first round was technology oriented. I had a conversation with a superintendent yesterday where we were talking about the fact that it was go out and get whatever you need right now to operationalize. This is gonna give us the ability to really do some thoughtful, deeper investments on the tech side. We're gonna get into a lot of that in this broadcast. There's gonna be a link in this week's broadcast for you to actually sign up on this particular webinar that we're gonna do. It's a WebEx. We want people to register for it. So if you wanna get in on the full sort of detail, again, it won't be long. We're gonna do an hour, we're gonna keep it to an hour, but the point is it'll be a single subject. So I think it'd be really helpful. And I just, Thanks, like, Kevin. To, Please, I just like to add, whenever Congress passes a major piece of legislation, this was included in a 5,500 page bill. Whenever Congress passes a major piece of legislation, it takes a while for the real details to come out. And so we're gonna be learning more over the next two weeks and able to get that in practical terms that district leaders and others can use. Well, thank you both. And uh, we'll be looking forward to doing that live with everyone. We normally re-record this and put this on YouTube, but that'll be a unique live event. And again, as Kevin mentioned, the registration link will be underneath the YouTube video and it will be in emails that we'll be sending out from both capital advisors and digital advisors. So look for that. Uh, so let's just jump in. Uh, here we go. We've been talking about stimulus since the, the last stimulus. And uh, finally, it looks like something's happened. Bob, would you just kind of walk us through what's happened so far and if there's any additional risk before this thing is, uh, is, is, is real? So, yes, there's a lot that's happened in the last week in federal matters, particularly stimulus. Let me just note real quickly, it does look like there will be a U.S. Secretary of Education appointed this week. His name most likely is Miguel Cardona. He is the state superintendent of Connecticut. And for district leaders, this is important because he has been an elementary school teacher. He was the youngest principal in the state at the time. He's now state superintendent. He's committed to getting students back into school safely. So somebody that is in the, has worked in the system at every level will now be most likely uh, the federal, uh, the, the leading, uh, is the federal secretary of education. So important to understand that it, I think you're gonna have a very responsive uh, sec, uh, Department of Education. Now, let's get down to the stimulus package. Uh, most of the stimulus package, it, with the exception of the broadband, is as we talked about last week. So let's quickly go through it. For K-12, $54 billion, largely uh, through Title I. Uh, there is $4 billion that goes to governors. Kevin's going to talk more about that in a minute. Uh, it's, and so um, 
it, it, and I think though one thing that's important, the overall s stimulus package that the education part is part of uh, is 900 and, and some billion dollars. Let's remember though, it, the reason it passed was because, and the reason it's a lesser amount than was in previous bills is because it is a shorter term bill. And while the education component is, will stretch out longer, the provisions that deal with uh, uh, avoiding evictions, uh, uh, supporting families that are unemployed, all that a district leader has to contend with, those are provisions that only extend for the most part through March. And so just be aware that for many of the families, it's going to be a, uh, this is only a short-term bill, and the question is whether the Congress is going to take on something longer. Education funding will last longer, but I just, in the education support is part of a community. Uh, and so those are the major provisions uh, dealing with, we're going to talk more about broadband in just a minute. Thanks, Bob. And uh, Kevin, let me just get your thoughts on this for how you see it, I guess, federally, and then how this impacts the state. Yeah, we did a little bit of an advisory that went out to all our clients today, a written piece. But one of the things that I really wanted to emphasize is that there's been a lot published in the last day, uh, last two days, about what this is actually going to mean for California. And almost everybody starts with the headline that it's four times the amount of money that that schools saw in the springtime. The problem is, is that that doesn't really square with what we got in California. So we're expecting about $6.8 billion out of this uh, that's gonna come under the education piece. Um, and it's gonna flow through largely through Title I, as Bob had mentioned. But the reason why I try to emphasize this is because Governor Newsom, when we got that shot of funding last time, remember that he used what were COVID relief dollars. They, they weren't prescribed for education. He had a broad latitude to do what he wanted with that money, but he used it for education because he was also looking at deep school cuts at the time. And in order to sort of backfill that, he wanted to be more generous with the dollars that he had were, that were actually able to be used for healthcare and a lot of other things. He piled that into education. So he made that pot of money, which otherwise would have been only about $1.5 billion, you know, six, roughly $6.8 billion at that time. Um, so it's almost the same amount of money that we get that's just for education this time in terms of what was spent on education. The reason why it's important is because the money that we got in the spring for schools all across the state was spread across four different pots. All four pots had different distribution methods. So almost every school district in the state got money. Under this pot, this $6.8 billion, it's going to emulate the rules under what we called ESSER, E-S-S-E-R. That was a much smaller pot last spring. All of it's going out under ESSER. It's all Title I. Almost 100 districts across the state will get $0, and it's because they're not Title I receiving districts. So that could be a problem. The governor will have a little tiny amount of money this time where he, that he has discretion over, it sounds like a lot, $4 billion, but because two thirds of the money must be spent on private schools, um, he's not gonna have a whole lot of money to use to help balance the fact that, um, that there are gonna be districts that don't get anything out of the ESSER pot. But we'll see what the governor does. I know his heart is more with you know, districts where there's a need to try to address the needs of kids in poverty, uh, English language learners, so I don't see him coming out of the chute immediately wanting to try to balance this for the districts that are not Title I, but we'll see what happens. Obviously, there'll be a lot of conversation about it, and we'll probably have more that first week of January when we come back. Well, thank you very much for that, Kevin. And I just want to prompt a little talk about the deadlines. We've talked about it many times, December 30th spending deadline. I believe those have been extended uh, for the reasons that Bob had mentioned before, but can you just talk about what the deadlines look like now? Yeah, they have indeed. Uh, this December 30th deadline, which was weird because we have 31 days in the month, was extended to December 31st, 2021. So it, it's, you know, it's, it's nice, but it's a little frustrating that it came so late because Congress couldn't get their act together, that just now you're finding out that you've got this latitude to go all the way to next year. There are a lot of districts that rush and did expenditures because they needed to spend the money on things, honestly, that probably wouldn't have been a bigger priority 
than if they got to actually be more, you know, contemplative about where they're spending their money. But there's a lot of districts in this state that got their act together and they had a plan and they spent it on time anyways. But it's always nice to have that extra time if in fact there is any leftover money so that you can think about it. And then they get, did sort of understand that December does have 31 days. The other thing is for the new money that runs through September of 2022. And, you know, I sort of jokingly re referenced when I saw that, that somebody finally figured out what, you know, when our school year usually runs till. Um, so that of course is a lot more appreciated 2022, uh, having that kind of latitude in terms of spending. So we'll see both of those are inserted into the into the guidance. And we'll talk again more about that at the January um, WebEx that we're gonna do on the, on the 5th. Tim, one other point I'd like to make, and I think it's important on this, is this bill that we're talking about, we're talking mainly about the stimulus package, but let's remember it was packaged with the overall education funding that the Congress and the federal government does every year. So um, what that means is that besides the stimulus money, there's the regular funding that's coming. And for most, it, there was a slight increase in Title I, but for the most part, it's pretty much what you got last year. But all of this is moving forward at the same time, $1.4 trillion total uh, in regular federal appropriations called the Omnibus spend, uh, Budget Bill. And then the 900 billion, uh, of which 54 billion goes K-12, uh, uh, in there, but they're, they're all joined into one. And that's, that's important because at the time we're having this discussion, the threat, the president is threatening to veto the whole, the whole package. I will be surprised if he does, but at any rate, he's threatening to veto it. And if he does, then the Congress has to come back and I would pr predict override that veto. It is interesting, Bob, that, um, speaker Pelosi's kind of response to the veto threat mm -hmm. was like, bring it on. And. I think what she was trying to underscore is that I guess congressional Democrats had been in favor of a higher amount for individuals for quite some time and that he sort of joins that. It's really an issue about whether Senate Republicans could get there as well. But I think I think most of them would not like to see this thing vetoed. But if it if it is, I imagine it looks like the House is ready to come back and make a bigger deal work. You know, any time you suggest a bigger deal, they're they're down for that. So, yes. Yeah. Well, I guess uh, we will once again cross our fingers <laughs> to hope that the veto doesn't happen. We actually see this uh, this, this put into place, and uh, and again, we'll be covering more and more on that that January fifth WebEx that you mentioned, Kevin. So, uh, Governor Wise, you'd mentioned the you know the broadband dollars, and certainly happy to see some dollars earmarked for broadband in this uh, a, a significant amount. And would you just mind breaking that down for us, please? Sure, we'll break it down real quickly. Roughly $7 billion in additional broadband uh, funding. 3.2 goes to uh, support family, low-income families, get connectivity and devices. And it, But I want to stress, this is not through E-rate. And it's, it may not even be through the existing lifeline program, but it will be money that goes to the federal communications commission. It's where it breaks out to about $50 a month rebate to families, low income families for connectivity, uh, internet providers, if they choose to provide devices can get up to a hundred dollars rebate for the devices they provide another. So that's 3.2, another billion for tribal lands, uh, connectivity, 300 million for, uh, rural. Uh, that got, there was additional money in the initial CARES Act for rural as well. 65 million, Tim, goes to the Federal Communications Commission doing the mapping of where there needs to be connectivity. Congress had approved this earlier, but no money went to it. So 65 million for that. 250 million for telehealth initiatives. And finally, uh, $2 billion, and Tim, I know this is a favorite of yours, $2 billion is going to systems that have Huawei Chinese Huawei equipment in them, Huawei being a Chinese company that uh, is now uh, banned by the US. Uh, and so it, 2 billion to rip out that equipment. So that comes to a total of 7 billion. We're gonna learn a lot more about how it's administered because right now it's a, the 3.2 billion is a little bit murky, except for coming through the Federal Communications Commission. And on that note, the important thing is uh, stay tuned because the Federal Communications Commission is going to be writing a lot of rules on this and procedures. The, it will have a major change on January the 20th because the 
existing chair of the Federal Communications Commission, Chairman Pai, has announced that he will step down. He's a Republican. He will step down. So the Biden administration will be appointing a new chair, and that could change a lot in terms of the flexibility that districts and others have to getting uh, E-rate, Lifeline, and whatever this new fund uh, is about. Well, thanks for sharing that, Bob. And I guess I'll just uh, pile on with some of my thoughts here. As each stimulus has been proposed, heroes on and on, there has been dollars that were set aside to boost E-rate. And then there was even a question of where we're going to add cybersecurity or not. There were studies done on the dollars needed. Now, the dollars that are pulled out in this, it's significant. Like you said, it's a, you know billions of dollars that's going to be distributed out to $50 per family to address connectivity. Um, that is that is wonderful, but in my opinion, we still have not addressed one of the most important vehicles schools use to get connectivity to sites, to adapt that funding to be able to address distance learning. And the fact that we miss that with this bill, just I guess to me is unacceptable, and I'm sorry I'm so frustrated everybody, but um, the, because we got the stimulus, I believe that there's advocacy that we still need to do. And as I brought up before this show, I don't know the last time you checked your internet bill at home, folks that watch this, but I haven't seen an internet bill for less than for fifty dollars, for less than seventy-five dollars, for really what we would call you know robust broadband that you could work and learn from home. And I would say seventy-five, more like a hundred dollars, uh, perhaps if if you if you really look at what your bill is. So it's fifty dollars better than ten, which was the old Lifeline program. Yes. But is it enough? That's my question. And I don't know. We have to kind of see how this whole play thing plays out. We'll talk more about it January 5th. But again, the fact that we haven't seen any adjustment to E-rate in this is really staggering for me. And I hope that we see that as soon as possible when Pi leaves and the new administration comes in. Um, I also want to just add a little bit of comment about the you know two and a half billion dollars that's been set aside from the federal government to take out Chinese equipment from state and local and federal government agencies and replace that with non Huawei and non ZTE. In other words, non Chinese equipment. While I believe that's important, I have a hard time seeing how that is more important than getting connectivity to people who don't have it. So let's say uh, 3 billion went to this initiative. If we could take half of that money that was earmarked at pulling out Chinese equipment that technically works, we're worried that they're sending information back to China. We're also probably uh, continuing that trade war, trying to hurt China. Um, if we're if we're if we could cut half of that, feed it over to the dollars that we're sending families, we could get to seventy five dollars per person. Something that is reasonable and sustainable long term. So you know, for me, again, you can hear a little bit of frustration. And Bob, you're asking me to calm down a little bit before. So hopefully, I did this in a little bit more mild uh, manner. But I, I see some major challenges with this, and I believe that there's still, still some advocacy work we can do to get adequate internet funding for all that don't have it so people can work and learn from home. And with that, I'm going to just jump off the soapbox. Um, Kevin, is there anything I needed to clarify there? Because I could, might have got to so, you, you really did a good job, Bob. What are your, what are your thoughts? I, I just want to, I want to go back to something you said earlier about the need for advocacy. Remember that what is in this bill is a fraction. It's maybe 25% of what has been in initial other bills proposing uh, broadband connectivity. So you're absolutely right about the need for continued advocacy. Uh, President-elect Biden has talked about this bill being only a down payment. He's going to have a, there's going to be a, it's a rough Congress to work with. It, so the question is, will it be a down payment or the final payment? And what you're saying and what we all agree is there needs to be much more. This needs to be a first step, not the last one. And that's why advocacy is going to be important. Excellent. Thanks for clearing that up, Bob. And uh, Kevin, let's let's jump into some of the, the other, uh, I guess, as things are shifting in DC and in California, can you jump into some of those musical chairs that we're seeing people switch in spots and uh, fill us in the latest there, please? Yeah, well, of course, the most notable big announcement that the governor made was finally the appointment of Alex Padilla, our current Secretary of State, to be the United States Senator that will fill the vacancy left by Kamala Harris. That's really big news, uh, the first Latino to fill that seat. Um, senator, he was a state senator before he was Secretary of State, you know, has a, a good working relationship with Jack O'Connell and several of the people on our, our team, uh, as many of our clients know, who come to Sacramento. Um, Alex has been a frequent visitor 
with our clients on issues up here in Sacramento. It's been nice. So it's great to see him go back to the U.S. Senate. And then the Secretary of State position was announced as well by the governor, Dr. Shirley Weber, assembly member uh, out of San Diego. Again, no stranger to all of our clients at Capital Advisors Group. She was at one year the chair of the full budget committee. Um, so she knows her stuff with regard to budget. Um, she's worked real hard on a lot of budget and fiscal issues. She moves over to the secretary of state position. So that will leave that assembly seat now open and it will be filled by a special election down there in San Diego. So, you know, the scramble continues, but we got a couple of officials that we've got a long history of working with at pretty high levels that we're pretty excited about. Well, wonderful, Kevin. I guess it's nice to see that kind of start to sh take shape and, you know, how that's going to impact us. And I think it's it's not that surprising from what you've you've sort of predicted, but it is nice to see the actual folks and how that, that, that again, how that's going to play out for us. So, you know, I want to talk a little bit about something we spoke about last week, which is immunizations. And there's a little bit more news there. Can you share that from this week, please? Yeah, I mean, I just wanted to update people a little bit. Um, so over the weekend, the National Advisory Committee did meet and they did prioritize teachers as the next top of the list nationally. Um, states get to really direct this stuff. So there is gonna be another meeting. Actually, it's it as of the time that you watch this, that meeting will have happened. We fully expect that the state's Vaccine Advisory Committee will also ratify the notion that education, the education community is next on the list with other uh, essential employees. That's 1.7, they estimate, 1.7 uh, million uh, employees in the education community. It was real important as the education community, CSBA, AXA, CASBO, others that were engaged in the advocacy on this, all of us collectively, that we emphasize to the state that it's more than just teachers, but the entire family of education community that are around our kids um, and also creating obviously the incentive for bringing you know, schools back online is making sure that everybody's got um, obviously uh, the vaccines. So it's substitutes, it's all the ancillary players on a school district in addition to those that are directly in the classroom. So that's very positive news that that will be a big priority. Um, there are also one of the things that I wanted to mention too, Bob, that I noticed in the bill, they it did not have the 160 billion dollars that you know state and local governments wanted, but it did have 22 billion dollars in it to be distributed across the country to states for the deployment of the vaccine and testing. So there are going to be some pretty big resources that are probably as much as a couple billion dollars for California specifically. It's going to help us on the deployment uh, of of that uh, the vaccines and also the testing issues that we've had so much trouble with. So I think uh, you're going to hear more from the the state on testing, particularly as it relates to schools, really in the coming days and weeks. Um, and we'll probably give you an update on that one as well on our January 5th uh, broadcast. Well, thanks, Kevin. And uh, I'll just say it's, um, again, re reiterate what I said last week. I'm so glad that we're talking about when we're going to get the vaccine, not if. So uh, that that's great news. And we'll look forward to getting more clear timeline as that evolves. So, um, you know, last point here for the week is uh, we'll go back to something that we talked about before that ties into major crisis today, which is, again, cybersecurity. But the federal government has uh, recommended that they split out National Cyber Command, Cybersecurity Command from the NSA. And as you know, Kevin, you'll remember when we had Brian Olson on, who's our cybersecurity expert at Digital Advisors, he was saying that you know technology teams are not equipped to handle the types of uh, you know challenges and threats that are coming in to cybersecurity today. It's the largest companies in the world are struggling with it. The federal government, um, every size organization. So dedicating a specific team and resources to this challenge is necessary in today's world. So please support your tech teams in giving them extra uh, boost, uh, you know, resources, dollars 
um, you know, the, the, the flexibility to, to expand the work on the cybersecurity side. Because if you have one person that's trying to run it all, they're gonna be overwhelmed with just the basics. And this is gonna be, you know, just too tough for them. Or even a large team. Again, the largest companies in the world are struggling. So make sure you double down on the focus. And I'll just go back to something you said earlier, Kevin. You have more time with these dollars to be thoughtful about what you spend out money on. And certainly ounces of prevention here are, are, uh, are, are it's time. <laughs> this, is, this is the time to invest in this area. So I wanted to call that out before we wrap up. And again, I wanna thank you, Bob, for joining us. Uh, just see if you have any final thoughts before we wrap up today. A lot, no, it's been a great, uh, it's, it's been a very productive uh, discussion and just be aware that I think even more is gonna be happening as details become known on the stimulus package, on the appropriations bill, uh, on the FCC and directions is going a lot happening over the even have happy holiday everybody and know that a lot has happened. Thank you so much, Bob and Kevin. Any final words from you, please? Yeah, I mean, I do want to emphasize that the live event we will do in January requires you to register. So we are going to send some stuff out in addition on that, but the link is here. And then happy holidays. Uh, it's been a it's been a very interesting year, and it's been great to get these update started for you to give you a quick way to get all your news without having to you know plow through a bunch of paper yeah tim could i give one holiday wish that i just please uh kevin reminded me of is so hap my wish for everyone is that 2020 has been our year of educational triage may 2021 be our year of educational transformation well said, Bob. Thank you. And yeah, I'll just reiterate everyone. Uh, happy holidays from, from us to you and your uh, family and loved ones and friends. And, uh, you know, we're expecting to have a much, uh, let's say, a happier year, let's hope. Um, so I just and I also want to reiterate, Kevin, we're looking forward to doing that event January 5th. You will need to register. So please do. And my final request, if you can give us a gift, reshare this into your social media networks. That will really help us reach more people with this free content. We hope we're glad it's helping you. Please allow us to help others. So with that, I want to say thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful time and we'll see you January 5th on the live event. So thanks again for joining us for another week of this broadcast. And I just want to take a moment to remind you, if you haven't already, please subscribe to our channel and share this out over social media. Again, you're our marketing team. I'll also finish by saying, if you have some questions, please send them our way. We'd be happy to address them on a future broadcast. So with that, thanks everybody and we'll talk soon.